Yeah. Um, hello, everyone, and I warmly welcome you to the fifth already um, webinar in the Partners webinar series. Um, today, the title is "Boost Your E-Amenities in E-Heritage Research with Research Infrastructures," and I'm conducting this webinar together with Daria Fischer from the University of Ljubljana. You should be soon able to see her as well. She just has to um, activate her camera and uh, probably also her sound. Hello, Daya. So Daya is joining us live from Ljubljana. Um, before we start, um, just uh, some housekeeping. Um, just to explain you, especially for those who are for the first time in a webinar here, um, how uh, everything works. So you will already have noticed um, that as a participant, you are muted and you can also not be seen through the outer webinar, but you are very warmly welcome to use uh, the chat, which you see um, at the right side um, below, you see a window chat for everyone. You can use that for questions, remark, whatever, just put it in there and we take notice of it. Um, we have left time after our uh, presentations um, that uh, we can use to answer your questions. So don't hesitate to put anything that comes up in your mind into the chat. Um, in case you have any sound uh, problems, um, you might have to restart your computer, check your technical settings. Um, and uh, everything should be worked then. At the end of the webinar, we will um, send you an email with a link to a short feedback survey. We will also post the link in the chat and we would be very grateful if you take the time and answer these few questions um, to help us improve the webinars. Some words about uh, Paternos, the project I work for and for which I host um, the webinar series. So Paternos um, is an acronym and it stands for Pooling Activities, Resources and Tools for Heritage, E-Research, Networking, Optimization and Synergies. Now, this is a very complicated acronym and to put um, our main uh, goals into a very short sentence is that the Partners as a Horizon 2020 project aims to strengthen the cohesion of heritage related e-research and e-research infrastructures. It's a very international project. We have 60 partners in nine European countries and we are coordinated by PIN. Um, the coordination office is in Italy. And here, this Partners webinar series for which you joined us um, is actually a cross Partners training effort. So many of the work packages and the cluster partners are involved in the series. Like, for example, um, my co-trainer for today, Daria, is involved uh, in Clarin and also a bit in the work package too. So. But uh, before we start, um, we are always very curious um, about you from where you joined us uh, today. So it's also a good chance for you to search for the chat and try it out for the first time. Um, yeah, so where do you come from? We are at Potsdam and Ljubljana. Vienna, Leiden. Wow, that was really fast. <laughs> I have to scroll back a bit. So that's Leiden, Vienna, Münster, Bonn, Perm. I see also many familiar names. That is really cool. Um, Göttingen, Spain, Amsterdam, Munich, Potsdam again. It's back on here. Cameroon. Wow, that's the first time we have someone from Cameroon in the webinar series. Cologne, Berlin, Slovenia, Athens. Okay, that's really cool. It's a very, very international crowd. 
Um, so we're very happy you are here and uh, we will start then now um, with what you came for here and um, I hope you will have a very good time and learn a lot. Um, I would like to introduce to you Daria Fisser. Um, I'm very happy that uh, she agreed to be a trainer for this webinar series. Um, she is a bit ill today, so she's coughing a lot, uh, but uh, I'm very happy we didn't have to um, postpone the webinar. We are conducting it, but uh, bear with us. Uh, I, uh, it might be sometimes uh, a bit noisy, but uh, we'll, we will manage. Um, Daya is an assistant professor, and she is also chair of the unit for lexicology, terminology, and language technology at the Department of translation studies at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Ljubljana. She's a corpus linguist and also an expert in translation technologies and she has very many um, uh, important uh, functions in this uh, field. Um, just to mention uh, two of them, she is the president of the Slovenian Language Technology Society and she is also the director of user involvement of um, the European Research Infrastructure Clarin, of which you will also hear more during this webinar. So thank you, Daya, for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Can you hear me OK? I hear you very well. I hope so, the participants too. OK. So, uh, to return the favor, I would like to uh, introduce Ulrike. Ulrike Wutke is a medievalist and a textual scholar, and she specializes in medieval Dutch literature. She has a long history of working within the digital humanities research infrastructures. She has been scientific coordinator of the Agate project. She has worked for the Humanities Data Center in Göttingen. She has worked for the Göttingen E-Research Alliance. Uh, throughout her career, she was strongly involved in the general strategic development, as well as in the development of services according to the feedback they have obtained from the community, uh, communication, outreach, and training issues. For example, uh, things like data management, open access issues, and digital humanities issues in general. For the Partenos project, she is the task leader of implementation of the integrated training plan. So everything that you are uh, experiencing, getting from the webinars and from online training modules is the result of her very hard work. No. Thank you, that was very flattering. Um, it's not only the result of my hard work, but uh, of all members um, of the Partners Training Work Package and also um, many, many partners in and out of the project. Okay, but enough from us then. Let's start with our topic. Um, just a very short recap on what we will do in this uh, webinar. Um, what we also announced is that we want to highlight um, advantages of developing research questions in an, we call it, infrastructural way. We want to exemplify aspects of finding, working and contributing data to research infrastructures and also using virtual research environments and tools. And we want to present citizen sciences approaches for humanities and heritage research. And now the floor is to Daya. OK, before we start with the actual slides and content of the webinar, we wanted to test the field a little bit and get some more insight into your own backgrounds and your own ways of working and approaching research. So if you think about uh, your previous or current research projects, what for you is the first step in a research project? Or in other words, how do you start a research project? Uh, can you please take a look at the window and just type in your answer and submit so that we can collect your feedback and take it from there?
So some people start looking for related work. Some people uh, start reading theory. Some people try to identify a relevant problem in the specific field. Some people try and uh, find an appropriate research question. There are several of these answers. Define the research question, formulate a research question, find a research question. So digging through a related work, trying to articulate a research question, seem to be the prevalent entry points in the research projects. A very interesting and valuable answer for this webinar is the answer that colleagues start research projects and include me. I think we will uh, tackle this uh, towards the end of the webinar. So keep this answer in mind. This is a very valid answer. Okay, uh, so to continue, um, I would like to address the issue of what developing research questions means in humanities or more specifically digital humanities and how we approach it. Um, when we have, or if you can imagine that you have a large text collection available in digital form, then you can start approaching your research questions or finding research questions um, in a different way than uh, was done traditionally. Uh, so you don't necessarily need, through, uh, need to go through related work, through the bibliography or to study theory only. You can also start somewhere in the middle, really, uh, and just get into the uh, textual data that you have available. You can use a number of very simple, already available automatic techniques and computer tools um, that give you an exploratory opportunity to play around with your data. And once you have explored your text collection, sometimes uh, what you get from frequency lists, from keyword lists, from n-grams, from some simple visualizations of exploratory statistics, you will immediately recognize the interesting parts of your material. And this can actually be the new gateway, the new entry point to start formulating uh, your research questions. And I want to show you an example how this was successfully done uh, in a previous research project, uh, which is relevant for the uh, wide scope of digital humanities, but relied on uh, the linguistic aspects of the particular text collection. The text collection is called Gesta Danorum. It's a very important body of work. It was written in about uh, 1200 in High Latin by a famous Danish historian. He wrote 16 books in which he described the period of time from King Dan to Canute VI of Denmark. And this important canonical body of work for the whole of Denmark uh, was traditionally divided into two parts. The first part was supposed to be books one to nine, which tackled uh, the Norse mythology. And then the second part was books 10 to 16, which were supposed to describe Christianity. However, at the, eight, uh, at the end of the 1960s, there was um, uh, a scholar who posed an alternative hypothesis, suggesting that maybe what we should be dividing is books 1 to 10, and then from 10 onwards. He hypothesized that it was book 10 that really represented the transition from Norse mythology to Christianity period. 
So when we have the digital uh, text collection, this was of course written in Latin and then translated into Danish, so we are working with Danish data, we can assume that whenever the, the transition to Christianity Christianity has already happened, we will be seeing a much higher frequency of the terms, vocabulary used that belong to the Christian register. So you can use a simple concordancer to try and query a few of these terms. And if you are happy with your initial re results, you can then really tackle the issue of trying to come up with a complete list of Christian register terms, try to generalize your search query in the textual corpus, and then the results I exemplify in the picture below. These are the results, uh, these are the normalized frequencies for each book displayed separately. And as you can see towards the bottom of the image, you see increased frequencies of the Christian vocabulary. And as you can see, the frequency really starts picking up uh, after book eight. So in book eight, we still have a uh, pre pretty low frequency, but after nine and 10, we see 10 times higher frequency numbers. So the answer to this research question is yes, the hypothesis was indeed confirmed. The change in terms of Christian language did indeed happen between books 8 and 9. Okay, uh, so to continue, this is all a nice story, right? But for this, you need your, your text collection, something to start working with. And Many scholars spend a lot of their time not doing the actual research, but uh, making the text collection available in digitized form. This is very hard work, it's very time consuming, but from a research perspective, doesn't bring a lot of added value. And this was a very necessary step in the so-called first generation of digital humanities, but nowadays, I think we have moved past this first generation in many contexts. So for a researcher, the smartest way to start is not to start producing your text collection, but try and find one in some archive, for example, research infrastructures. I will show you three options how to find existing uh, text collections in the Clarin infrastructure, which is an infrastructure for language resources and technologies. The first one is an overview of Clarion resource families. We are starting this initiative only this year, so we have so far compiled overviews of the available corpora for five different text types. If you're lucky that your research interests lie into these fields, you can, you can easily access these overviews and find the corpus of your choice. If you're not as lucky, but you already know what kind of keywords or concepts you're interested in, you can access our federated content search uh, system, which is almost like Google for research infrastructures. You type in your keywords, you will get hits in all the available text collections that we have in the research infrastructure. While you are browsing through them, you can then see which collection is the one that you need before you actually do any downloading or file conversion or so on. If not even this is suitable for you, we have provided, developed a very detailed, very power, powerful search engine called the Virtual Language Observatory, which is an aggregator of metadata of many sources of language resources. Again, you can just query either the name of the resource or the type of the resource. You can also use a lot of different facets, like the language you're interested in, the type of research resource you're looking for, and so on.
And uh, in the image below, you can see one such example. Specifically, this example displays the parallel English Czech corpus that was produced from Wikipedia. Once you have um, found the resource that you want to be working with, you can then move on to the tools that research infrastructures make available. Just finding the text collection is not enough for you. So basically, you can start with a digitized book, like I showed at the bottom of this page, and you can move forward by examining all the metadata uh, that we know about this book. Specifically, what is important for us is the license. This one is a good license uh, for researchers to use. And then the uh, text format you can see at the bottom. Uh, then at the very bottom, the image is quite small, but I think you can see, see the important button. There is a link to the Clarin language switchboard, which is an online service for processing natural language text without you having to know any programming skills or without the need for you to install any software. So based on the language in which the text is written, you can see in the third picture here for German, this is a German text, um, what levels of natural language processing uh, tools and services we have available. Just for this particular example, I selected part of speech tagging, lemmatization, and named entity recognition. And now we uh, achieve the highest stage of our pre-processing step, which is the final result, the output of this tool chain, which is a tabular form. In the first um, column, you have the verticalized text. In the second column, you have part of speech tags, then lemmas, and then annotated named entities. Now you can take this result and feed it to any tool of your choosing to then really start doing the research. But these four stages uh, that are necessary for you to be able to start your research are much easier and much less time consuming. At the very bottom of the slide, you can see another logo, which is a, a logo for the web ano tool. Sometimes you will not be able to automatically annotate um, anything that you might need for your specific research project. Sometimes we still need to rely on manual annotations to be able to obtain re reliable annotated data. In these cases, you can use one of our tools that we provide at Clarin, specifically Clarin Germany, which allows for uh, manual annotations of the um, linguistic data. It doesn't have to be just for linguistic projects. It can be history, social science, anything you like. The beauty of this tool is that it's online and that it allows for collaborative annotation. So you can have your students or your assistant annotating, and then you can see the curation stage where you can decide which annotation is correct, and you can also see how accurate individual annotators are. So it's quite a powerful tool. I was now explaining uh, the, the tools and the gateways to the research data from a Clarin, Clarin perspective. I don't want to say this is the only research infrastructure, but that there are many. The principles, however, of digging into the material and using the material should be very similar. That's why I included a slide from one of the previous webinars that was offered by Steven Crower, also from uh, Clarin. Okay, and now I give the floor to Ulrike on another topic, namely the Cultural Heritage Data Reuse Charter. Thank you. Um, yes. So we have uh, heard already a lot of uh, textual data um, and uh, very interesting examples from the Clarion infrastructure. 
Now, when we talk about uh, developing research questions with infrastructures, a very crucial point, and it has been mentioned also by Daya already several times, um, is uh, the licensing, um, is a lack of accurate, transparent, and also easily understandable conditions of access to documents and to um, collections, especially also of uh, pictures, uh, cultural heritage collections. Now, at the moment, a very typical scenario you may encounter as a researcher is that the data you wish to use, um, you find them somewhere, and then you have to find out how you can get access, you start fill in forms, you start a long correspondence with a cultural heritage institution, and then you wait and wait and wait until you may get access. Now, this is not a very ideal scenario from a user perspective. And also for the cultural heritage institutions, this is not ideal. Now to address this challenge of openness, um, the data, the cultural heritage data reuse charter initiative was started. And the aim of it is that it seeks to facilitate the standardization of reuse conditions and to translate them to the user needs. So what will it do? The ch charter will actually provide a non-restrictive and easy to use framework and it seeks to provide incentives and also back practices for all stakeholders. It will be an online environment, but it's not ready yet. The charter is currently being developed by many several partners. Um, most of them are supranational research infrastructures such as Daria or Clarin, but also projects like Partners is involved in developing the charter. The vision it wants to fulfill is that at the end, with the charter in place, researchers will waste no more time clarifying the reuse conditions, and that in the end we will have more open GLAM data to do research with. So what you can do at the moment already with the charter is go to the mission statement of the charter. Um, the, you will find the link on the slide. And you can um, also um, watch a very long, uh, quite long and elaborate talk about the charter on the Partenos training suite. That's from me, from the Charter, a very um, interesting and also very um, hopeful uh, initiative um, that will improve the state of open data in the cultural heritage sector. But now I hand over to Daria, because now we will dive a bit deeper into research examples um, from the digital humanities yes, thank and heritage. You. Um, so. We wanted to highlight, show you a couple of examples uh, from a diverse um, <clears throat> uh, sort of set of backgrounds with very different kinds of goals um, and their different levels of maturity. The first uh, example of a successful project, DH project, that I want to mention is the Talk of Europe project, which is already a completed project. It was uh, done in collaboration by five Dutch uh, institutions, research institutions. It was financially uh, co-funded by Clarin Eric and the Dutch branch of Clarin, as well as other funders. And it had a very ambitious goal, which was to facilitate research um, in the European Parliament data by turning the European Parliament proceedings into something that's called linked open data and then to organize creative camps to spark collaborative development on the new database. Um, European Parliament debates are held in the European Parliament on a regular monthly basis and they are publicly released immediately after, after the session is over. 
So there's a lot of discussions going on. A lot of important things are being said and decided in the European Parliament. And they are also trying to be a transparent democratic body, which is why they are making all these discussions as proceedings publicly available on their website. This makes it an interesting resource for researchers from very different backgrounds, social scientists, political scientists, uh, digital humanities scientists, because European Parliament uh, operates with all the official languages of the European Union, it's also a highly multilingual resource available in 21 European languages. So turning this into a database that researchers can um, query has a lot of potential. And this project turned the proceedings into a linked open data, uh, database. Uh, what does this mean? First, they made the proceedings uh, machine readable uh, so that the semantics of what was going on, of the context, was made explicitly available so that with a proper query, you could now search through the database to, for example, give me politicians who held a speech on the 23rd of March in 2011. Uh, this was not enough. We tr they tried to be more ambitious. They tried to make the database linked, linked with the external knowledge sources, so that you could, for example, connect the speech of politicians with their backgrounds. Once you had the profiles of the politicians encoded in the database, you could then query for politicians from the Committee on Foreign Affairs who held a speech on the 23rd of March in 2011. Not only that, uh, the database was made open so that it could be enriched by anyone else with any additional tools and knowledge. So that, ideally speaking, you could then also query for politicians from the Committee on Foreign Affairs who held a speech on the topic of human rights on the 23rd of March 2011. Uh, this was basically the goal, as well as the result of the Talk of Europe project. Three creative camps were organized where people from all European countries, from various different backgrounds, got together to discuss and develop the tools that could uh, benefit from this linked open data database. Let's now take a look at the different project examples, Ulrike. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a, also a language related example, um, but it comes uh, from quite a different perspective and it also involves uh, data from another research uh, infrastructure project. So this is um, a project that's called a digital database of manuscripts and intercultural dialogue in post-conquest England. And what is the aim here is to create and analyze a European data model compliant digital database of almost 10,000 manuscripts that contain French literature from medieval England. So what this is a ongoing research um, is very new research. It has gotten a European research grant, so we will only see the results um, in uh, some months. Um, but uh, what I think is very interesting about uh, this... Um... Oh, sorry, I just see the correction in the ch chat. Sorry, it's only 1,000 um, manuscripts, not 10,000. Um, that would be also quite a huge amount of data. Um, but uh, what I think is very interesting um, here is that uh, based on those Europeana data, um, it will be possible to research the status of French um, in uh, English uh, writing. And it is also a, a, a good example of uh, showing how you can use data collections 
to solve research questions that would have been very tedious to resolve before. Just uh, yourself um, analyzing these uh, huge number of manuscripts would be uh, take a lot of time and now you can dive already into available data. And um, the researcher herself, Krista Murchison from Leiden University, also says that uh, this is very exciting because um, I'm quoting her, checking linguistic data of a large number of manuscripts wouldn't be feasible without digitized manuscript collection. Just imagine you have, would have to first go to all the libraries and uh, collect the data yourself. So I hand over back to Daya for the next example. The next project is a sort of a shameless advertisement of a project that I was leading. It recently finished and just today our final project book was published. So I'm very happy with uh, the results of this morning. Um, but on a more serious note, uh, I wanted to exemplify on this particular slide a project that was done uh, in collaboration with linguists and computer scientists, as well as the National Research Infrastructure for Language Technologies. The goal of the project was to facilitate research of communication practices in social media by compiling a corpus of Slovene user-generated content, which is user-generated user content means social media language, uh, posts on networking sites, Wikipedia, and so on. In addition to that, the project also wanted to develop tools and resources to be able to automatically process uh, user-generated content. Why is this important? For linguists, this is an important research uh, problem because, as you are all aware, uh, just like you don't want to always wear your evening dress to all occasions where you go and what you do, you don't also always use the official, official formal standard language. For chatting with friends on Twitter, we very often consciously or subconsciously deviate from the norm and uh, no resource was yet available to analyze this type of language use. For computer experts, uh, this project was important because more and more linguistic content is available being uh, created online by people who type with ty spelling errors or typing errors uh, there are some new ways of communication and the standard NLP tools that are trained on, for example, newspaper texts, they uh, almost break down. They cannot deal with non-standard language. So they were interested in providing resources to train new tools that can also uh, deal with the so-called dirty or noisy language from the web. The research results <clears throat> were much more than was initially expe expected in that we produced richly annotated corpora that have very rich user metadata, a lot of which you can get almost free of charge from the social media sites. Others you can manually annotate or automatically assign. Uh, there's a lot of metadata on the text level for example, not only do we record the date of the post and the language of the post, but we also developed a tool that can measure how standard the language in a particular post is, as well as what sentiment it is in. Is it a positive message, a negative message, and so on. In terms of linguistic annotation, we have also um, offered a new level of uh, annotation, which is the normalization of non-standard spelled words into their standard equivalents. We did the uh, post-tagging lemmatization named entity recognition as standard. In addition to the corpora, we uh, developed smaller sized manually annotated datasets that can on the one hand be used to train NLP tools so that you can now parse syntactically or tag for part of speech or normalize noisy web material, 
and also for linguistic analysis. For example, we manually annotated the abbreviation strategies in tweets. As you know, when you type on the phone and you have 140 characters uh, length limit, you want to be economical with your language. We also uh, annotated uh, a small corpus uh, with the uh, comma placement. Commas uh, are a very hard not to crack in Slovene linguistics. No, nobody, almost nobody can uh, write commas properly, so this is a very hot research area. Uh, we also annotated code switching, where Slovenian users start using some foreign language in the middle of the tweet and why. We also annotated some elements that come from uh, dialects or different dialectal regions in the um, non-standard online texts. We also annotated some special user groups like corporate users, so companies um, and politicians. Um, the picture uh, at the bottom of the slide is an example of um, one of the results of the project where we used all the rich metadata and corpora to semi-automatically create a dictionary of Twitterese. So all the graphs were produced automatically. The uh, definitions and the example sentences were manually selected from the corpus. And uh, here you have links to the hits for this word in different corpus resources and also frequency counts. That's it about my own project. Let's try and finish with a project that isn't mine, but is also super inspiring. Ulrike? Yeah, um, you got totally carried away. A very interesting um, project. Uh, I just want to make a few words about the Venice Time Machine, as um, I think that many of you already know it. Um, and if you don't know it, um, totally have a look at this because this is a very fascinating vision of what you can do with digital humanities research with huge amount of data um, collecting um, different uh, and processing under different aspects. So the Venice Time Machine will capture almost 10,000 years of records of the Republic of Venice in a very dynamic uh, digital form. And what is interesting for many researchers is that uh, they have managed um, to cooperate with a, another infrastructure project, the Retranscribus, um, to uh, succeed in uh, automated text recognition um, for this uh, huge corpus um, which I think poses uh, many interesting aspects also for researchers in many um, as other fields. I won't uh, dwell on the Venice Time Machine, which is uh, one of the flagships of uh, European research in the humanities at least, uh, too, too long. Um, have a look at the resources. Um, we will share the slides um, about this uh, afterwards and um, maybe in a very few soon future um, we will have not only the Venice time machine but also time machines of other European uh, cities. So if I can say I would like to be part of one of the time machines then for Berlin. I want to Come then to the last point um, uh, in today's webinar, um, which is uh, about uh, citizen science and um, how you can engage the broader public um, in your digital humanities and heritage research or in your research uh, in general. So um, citizen science, um, one of the most successful um, citizen science projects so far has been the Galaxy Zoo. This is an astron astronomy project um, which over more than 150,000 participants. Um, but you don't have to think that big. Um, also uh, Wikipedia or Wikisourced uh, uh, projects are based on citizen science. Now what is 
citizen science. Um, if you are wondering, um, because there are many um, definitions uh, to say it in a very few words, it refers to the general public engagement in scientific research activities. And it means that citizens actively contribute to the science, um, either with their knowledge or with resources or with their tools. And citizen science um, has a very strong links with open science and with open innovation because it really aims to open up the research processes to actors from outside academia. And it's um, taken fully seriously also much more than just crowdsourcing a task. Especially now with the digital um, transformation, um, we have uh, many possibilities now um, developing and engaging in citizen science projects as uh, the new Web2 technologies enable us uh, very easily um, with sharing and annotation and everything um, related uh, to um, collaboratively doing research and so many of the citizen science projects actually now take place in the digital world world sorry um just a few examples so in which way citizens can be engaged in science there are a lot of uh, approaches um and there are very many different flavors so you can come from where the point that citizens are actually only passive observers, which is not citizen science. You can go via various stages until you actually involve them in the design of your research question. So you draw on your research question based on knowledge um, from the cloud, uh, from the cloud, from the crowd, sorry. Um, to come to some examples, uh, what citizen science projects could look like in the uh, humanities and in heritage science? First of all, it has really a long tradition. It's maybe a very new term, but in fact, citizen scientists um, were part of humanities research um, for quite a while before um, the research became more professionalized. And uh, here you see, for example, um, at least in Germany, very famous Heinrich Schliemann, um, who uh, found Troy and uh, actually he never studied archaeology. Now a recent um, project and it has gained some fame um, already um, outside its original context. This is an Irish project. It's called the Letters of 1916, um, which uh, uh, aims to create a crowdsourced digital collections of letters. Uh, that were written around the Easter Rising in Ireland um, in 1916. So what is the citizen science aspect uh, in this project? The participants transcribe, so they edit and tag the letters, but they also add new letters to the collections. So they play a part in data collection and also in um, the analysis of the sources. Another project, which I think is also very fascinating because it uses serious games or gamification, is the Artigo project. And here they have developed um, several serious games to promote art recognition. So the citizen scientists here describe the content of the artwork with keywords to help to develop a semantic search engine for digitized works of art. I can only recommend you to have a look at it and try it out yourself. Um, it's also very addictive. The last aspect um, here is just a few more examples. Citizen science um, is also now playing a huge role for libraries, especially in on their way of embracing uh, open science. 
So they open up um, also uh, their resources uh, they are developing to citizen scientists. So for example, um, people can contribute to regional biographies and bibliographies. They can uh, edit uh, Wikipedia articles or help transcribing regional sources. Uh, but libraries also um, grant access to tools, which is also very important, or they provide general research support. So these are just a few examples. Um, at the end of the slides, uh, you will find more links and references um, related to citizen science, um, especially also in the arts and humanities. Let me round up with a few words about the potentials of citizen science. I think it has a great potential for the humanities and heritage research uh, because this opening up of the research process um, will lead us to greater research diversity. Um, it can help us to develop new research questions and topics and also engage a broader public into um, our research. This is not only good for a wider dissemination, um, but it's at the heart of a better public understanding of the value of the humanities research. And last but not least, um, I already also pointed out it can help to create really huge data sets and to solve work intensive tasks. There are also a few challenges. Um, so you have to keep in mind which resources you need. Um, think about uh, sharing models and also about uh, legal aspects. But uh, mainly, you always have to ask yourself when you want to set up a citizen science project, what will you gain by working with the volunteers? And what will the volunteers gain by working with you? So what is their incentive at, uh, in contributing to the project you are developing? Now, citizen science is a new topic um, for research infrastructures. Um, as the name already says, research infrastructures are mainly set up for researchers but it's also gaining relevance. And um, we have set up a, a poll for you um, just to gain a short impression um, what you think from your perspective. You are totally free to say whatever you want, whether you have worked with research infrastructures as citizen scientists or not before um, what you think personally research infrastructures can do or should do for citizen science. Just leaving the poll open for a few um, moments to give you time to answer. Okay, so we have uh, opening data and interesting interaction. Mm. Make research methods and data available to general public. So this is more about transparency, access to data and tools and networking possibilities. Yeah, so they also should become part of the user crowd. Um, I will end the poll then now. Oh, still answers coming. Okay. I will end the poll now and also view your votes. Can we see them? Um, oh, you cannot see See them, sorry. Hmm. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. Um, I will post a, a screenshot of the results um, with the wrap up. Um, we have to also uh, come to the end of the webinar. Um, I will post the results um, for the wrap up so you can also have a look uh, back what uh, you have answered. Um, so to come to the take home messages. Um, we collected uh, quite a few of them. Um, I won't read out all of them, but I think to, to sum up uh, what uh, Daria and I wanted uh, to um, bring along during this uh, webinar is uh, first of all, check if you if the data and tools if data and tools you want to use um, are already available. So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, don't spend uh, most of the time of your research on uh, collecting a corpus um, that is already available. And um, also think from the beginning um, with open science in mind. So think of open data, open access and documentation. If this is only an afterthought, it will not work. Um, just at the last minute of your project uh, to share your data. And from the citizen science part, um, just uh, also here, um, it's not an add-on very often. Um, you really have to think through it from the beginning and develop your project uh, in a way that the incentives are interesting um, for citizen scientists uh, to imp uh, add and contribute uh, together with you to your research and then you also have to uh, create a fitting environment and last but not least collaborate you are not alone um, that what all research infrastructures small or big are for um, they are there to help you um, and also you can get technical expertise and support from experts um, more often than you initially would think. So that's um, the concluding words from me. And now the floor is open to more questions. Um, do we have already questions here? Um, maybe we can bring them here somewhere already. Also answered. Um, so there was the question if you will share the materials of the webinar. Yes, of course, um, on the Partners Training uh, website. Um, maybe um, you can. Uh, paste the link into the chat where um, the training website is. We also have a YouTube channel. Then there was a question about the resource Daria mentioned, but uh, we also um, answered this. Uh, this tool for manual annotation, the web anno. So the correct link is there. Daria said, yes, this is the correct link. Have a look at it. And now we have a question wondering could not artificial intelligence replace citizen science in some tasks i'm sorry. i'm skeptic if citizen science exists today more to make people engage and not because of the necessity of it um this is a very interesting question um i think some of the very work intensive tasks um Artificial intelligence has, has definitely um, some potential. I'm not a computer crack um, and I'm not uh, here to propagate uh, the artif arti artificial intelligence. Um, I think at the moment it's very often both. Uh, get people engaged, um, but very often they are also necess necessary. Like if you think of this article project, um, this is really, it has to be based on uh, human input uh, because machines at the moment really cannot understand art. So maybe if we do more of those projects, um, the machines will become smarter, but uh, we haven't reached this part yet. Mm. 
Yes, machines have to learn from humans, and then we have to take care of what we teach them. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? We are also already um, at uh, two o'clock, um, but uh, there were already many questions in between. We, we tried to answer already um, by using the chat. Um, I would be very, very happy if you would use um, the link to the feedback uh, survey and uh, share with us your impressions um, of the webinar. And we hope that you enjoyed it. Daya, can you speak? <laughs> That's very cool. Uh, maybe for some uh, closing remarks so we can say goodbye to the participants. Um, totally thrilled that so many of you were here and I hope you um, enjoyed it. It was also the very nice to collaborate on this particular webinar, I have to say. Okay, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. And we will close the webinar room then now. Um, bit by bit, I will make the materials available. We will upload it to SlideShare, to Zenodo, um, to YouTube, the, the film. So, And we collect all the places um, where material can be found in a little wrap up um, blog post we will post on the uh, Paternos training suite. So that's for the moment the last webinar of the series. See you in bye some bye. other context. Bye bye.